That's all right. It'll, it'll pass. <laughs> okay. What the hell am I going to talk about? Good thing I wore clean socks, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I gotta get I just gotta be silly. Just leave it to us, right? This is silly. <laughs> Should we start? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marshall Gans. I teach here at the Kennedy School. Uh, after having served for 28 years as a civil rights union and electoral organizer, and I've been asked to moderate this afternoon's panel towards the politics of solidarity, building a multiracial democracy. Politics is about power. Who has it, who can get it, and how they use it. The question this panel will address is whether a politics of race can be effective without a politics of solidarity. And whether a politics of solidarity can be real or effective without a politics of race. As the authors of the Miner's Canary argue since the founding of our country, race has defined who can participate in politics, been the object of political action, and shaped the content of political debate. Race has defined who can be free, who can marry whom, who can become a citizen, who can vote, how much these votes count, and whose votes get counted. Racial mobilization has generated political issues from abolition to Jim Crow to civil rights to affirmative action, and the politics of race has influenced states' rights, agrarian reform, labor rights, social policy, education policy, urban reform, and criminal justice. And in just the past year, race was a major factor in the presidential election and the elections of the mayors of two of our largest cities, Los Angeles and New York. But, as the authors argue, politics is not limited to elections. And the zero-sum calculus of a winner and a loser may actually exacerbate racial polarization. The relevance of race to who participates in public life, what policies they seek, and how they seek it reaches beyond elections into the politics of families, communities, movements, organizations, and the institutions in which we live our lives, civic associations, churches, schools, unions, cultural activities, and businesses. Having internal politics of their own, they also shape the politics of our city, state, and nation. So from this perspective, each panelist is going to be asked to respond to two questions. Can a politics of race succeed without a politics of solidarity? And if so, why? If not, why not? And can a politics of solidarity succeed without a politics of race? If so, why? And if not, why not? Now, I just want to explain the, the ground rules here, and then we'll uh, meet each of our panelists, and then we'll get going. Uh, after I introduce each of our panelists, each will have seven minutes timed. There's a little card here they're going to get that says one minute to go and so forth. So we're going to make plenty of space for discussion. Uh, after uh, all have been heard from, then we'll open the discussion for observations, questions, and challenges from the audience. Uh, at the conclusion, each panelist will then have two minutes uh, to offer their concluding remarks and reflections on what has been said. So let's proceed to meet our panelists. Um, our first panelist, Taj James, grew up in Ventura, California. And I should confess, there's a little connection here we figured out. Um, Gerald grew up in uh, San Bernardino, Ying Sun in San Francisco. I'm going to skip Andy for just a minute. Taj in Ventura. <laughs> I grew up in Bakersfield. Uh, but uh, they're all places in California. Plus, Andy spent six years with us out there in Los Angeles, so you can sort of think of this as a California voice, sort of wave of the future from here. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ty, Taj's father, uh, and, 
grandfather, African-American, is from Alabama, and his mother, white, is from California. After graduating from Ventura High School in 1991, he went on to Stanford, where he studied urban anthropology, focusing on core-based urban youth programs. After graduating in 1995, he became the Western Regional Organizer for the Children's Defense Fund, uh, a post he served until 1997. Uh, in 1997, he founded BLOC, an organization um, uh, for building leadership and organizing communities, uh, and also went to work uh, in 1997 as a youth organizer for Coleman Advocates. Uh, in 2001, um, he received a Rockefeller Next Generation Leadership Fellowship and since then has served as Executive Director of Movement Strategy Center in Oakland, California. Let's welcome Taj James. Andy Pettis grew up in, we're going to meet all the panelists, then we'll come through. Andy Pettis grew up in Philadelphia. Uh, her father of Irish background, her mother of Puerto Rican background. Um, after graduating from Parkway High School in 1989, she moved to Camden, New Jersey, where she worked as a veterinarian technician, veterinary technician, mm -hmm. and a counselor in a rape crisis center. Uh, but in 1992, moved to Los Angeles, where she continued her education at UCLA, where she graduated in sociology in 1996, receiving the Chancellor's Humanitarian and Service Awards. Until 1999, she served as executive director of Youth United for Community Action in California, then moved back to Philadelphia, where she now serves as assistant director of Youth United for Change. Let's welcome Andy. Ying Sun Ho uh, grew up in San Francisco, his father from Hawaii, his mother from Oregon. Uh, after graduating from George Washington High School in San Francisco in 1993, he went on to college at the University of California at Santa Cruz where he studied politics and graduated in 1997. Um, he continued, uh, he worked for a year uh, in San Francisco, tough assignment, uh, and then <laughs> continued his education at Bolt uh, law School, where he received his law degree in 2001. Uh, at the same time that he started law school, he also was a founding member of Let's Get Free, an Oakland youth group, a founder of Freedom Fighter Music, and a member of Standing Together to Organize a Revolutionary Movement. Since 2001, he served as staff attorney of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights in San Francisco. Let's welcome Ying Sun. Finally, Gerald Torres, co-author with Lonnie uh, Guineer of the book that's the focal point of our uh, panel today, grew up in San Bernardino, California. Uh, his father and mother having both grown up in Victorville, a railroad town in the California desert. Um, after graduating from San Bernardino High School in 1970, he went on to Stanford. Uh, continuing his ed education after graduating from Stanford at Yale Law School, he received his law degree in 1977 and also went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, sort of connection we discovered just recently. Returning to, school at the, returning to school at the University of Michigan, he received his LLM in 1980 and discovered his love for teaching. He's taught at the University of Pittsburgh, Vermont Law School, Harvard Law School, the University of Minnesota, and since 1993 at the University of Texas. His articles include Taking and Giving, Police Power, Public Value, and Private Right, and Translating uh, Yonondia. <laughs> How did I do it? Yonondia. Yonondia, all right, by precedent and example, the Mashpee Indian case. Taking time off from teaching, he served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Environmental and Natural Resources in the Department of, Washi of Justice in Washington and as counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno. He's now Vice Provost of the University of Texas and H.O. Head Centennial Professor in Real Property Law and co-author of The Miner's Canary. Let's welcome Gerald. Mm -hmm. Taj. Good afternoon, uh, good morning. I'm not sure what time it is. I got on a plane last night in Oakland at 11 and just got here, so um, forgive me if I'm, uh, if I'm a little uh, scattered. But um, I think it's, it's very relevant that we're all from California because a lot of the questions that are addressed in the book and that you've addressed are really being played out in California in some really dramatic ways. But before I want to talk about that, I just want to mention um, four people who've really 
inspired me and informed my perspective, and our, everything I say is, is very influenced by those people. And the first person is um, Lisa Sullivan, and she was um, the founder of the Black Student Leadership Network, which is a project of the Children's Defense Fund. And this was a project to try to replicate what SNCC had done for another generation. And she was trying to provide the support to my generation that Ella Baker had provided to hers in terms of helping the young folks of color to develop the leadership to build power in our communities. And uh, she passed away this last year. And um, I just wanted to, to mention her because uh, she's, her, her work and her legacies influenced my perspective and, and what I do. Um, the other person is Ella Baker, for obvious reasons. The other person is Sylvia Winter, who is a professor of black studies in Spanish and Portuguese at Stanford, and uh, one of the profound, most profound thinkers on, on race that I've ever encountered. And the, and the last person is Bayard Rustin, who's a person who was at the heart of a lot of what happened during the Civil Rights Movement, but is not a name that many people know. And that's part of the problem. Uh, that's part of the reason why we don't have a stronger movement right now, because the, the role that people like uh, Bayard played in that movement isn't being played as effectively as it needs to be right now. So those are three people to go. If you want to know more about what I think, find out more about what they think, and, and, you'll, and you'll learn a lot. Um, in answer to this question, um, for, I think for us, in some ways, it's, it's almost a rhetorical question. And, and I say that because I think to understand it, we have to look at what we're up against. And basically, what we're up against is that we have a group of people in this country who control a lot of our political apparatus and the resources, who have um, made a decision that the best way to, for them to, to hold on pow to power in the limited way that they understand it is to try to divide wedges between uh, press communities, divide wedges between different communities of color, divide wedges, drive wedges between communities of color and poor whites, divide wedges between communities of color and white women. Um, and to understand what we need to do, we need to understand what we're up against. And in California, over the last 10 years, as many of you know, we've faced a series of attacks, starting with Prop 184, which was three strikes, 187, which was attack on immigrants and um, their right to an education and basic services, Prop 209, which was an attack on affirmative action, um, Prop 21, which was a pack on, on young people um, trying to incarcerate youth of, at, as adults, Prop 22, which was an attack on gay and lesbian communities. And each of these attacks was systematically um, developed by the right, uh, implemented in California in an attempt to try to spread that policy throughout the nation. Um, and they've had some success with that. So what you've seen in response to that is over the last 10 years or so, there's been a whole infrastructure as communities of color have tried to figure out how to respond to this. We've been building institutions. We've been figuring out how to work together across these differences and try to respond uh, in a way that's, that's effective. And one of, the, one of the keys to this, and we've built institutions that are specifically targeting the, the media aspect of the rights attack, institutions that are specifically trying to build the power of, communi of, of, of communities of color, institutions that are explicitly about um, having more of a voice in the policy arena. But one of the things that's um, consistent across all these strategies is that one of the reasons why we lose is that we, we, when we get pulled onto our opponent's terrain, when we fight our battles within their terms. Um, and one of the things I think this book is encouraging us to do and one of the things we've been struggling to do in California is, is, is to figure out how we can change the rules of the game because we understand that unless we can change the rules, there's no way we can win the fight. Uh, and that's a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, the work that I've been doing has been specifically about helping to build uh, a next generation of young activists and organizers of color and helping them to get the resources and the skills and the relationships they need to build and sustain institutions to fight and lead a progressive movement. And our basic premise is that based on the history of this country and based on the situation that we're in, it's, it's people of color and communities of color that are going to lead a, in any kind of effective progressive movement because if we don't confront directly the issue of race, we can't effectively confront any of the other um, hierarchies and, and, and systems of, of stratification that uh, address, um, that are impacting our communities. So what the Movement Strategy Center tries to do in relationship to that is we train 
young organizers to be movement builders, because one of the bar barriers that we see to movement building <coughs> is how people think about organizations. And there's a debate right now going on, which some of you might have been a part of, about whether or not we need movements or not, whether or not we need organizations. And our perspective is that the problem is not organizations, the problem is the way people think about organizations. And we're trying to get people to see organizations as tools to build social movements organization as tools to bring together different constituencies that are working on different issues and care about different things, uh, but not ends and of themselves. So that's, that's a big part of the work that we're trying to do. Um, so we're helping young people to, to fight around um, issues like Prop 21, which is, as some of you may have heard, an initiative that was trying to incarcerate large numbers of youth of color in adult prisons and, and really make it easier for young, young people to get into prison. And some of the ways that we tried to fight intelligently around this issue was to help um, people who thought they might not be impacted by this law understand how it's going to impact them. And talk about both the, the disproportionate racial impact on young people of color and communities of color. And then also talk about how the fact that when we're spending all the money to build these new prisons, that's money that we're not going to have to educate all Californians. That's money that we're not going to have to provide health care to all Californians. That all um, Californians are going to be negatively impacted by this racial scapegoating policy that's being, being implemented. And um, the basic problem is that we don't have the re we have a winning strategy, but we don't have the resources to implement it. And one of the things that we're going to need if we're going to win is we're going to have to figure out how to help people of color get access to the kinds of resources that they need to build institutions with su sufficient power to make an impact. Because right now, if you're a person of color, for the most part, with some exceptions, you can get access to a lot of resources only if you're working at social service that's addressing individuals and trying to provide services to individuals. But if you're trying to engage communities in organizing and political activism, it's much harder to get access to resources because the people who are controlling those resources are much more afraid of us at taking that leadership. And so that's, that's in a lot of the fights that we've been in. We've, we've learned a lot of lessons. We've learned how to, how to develop a winning strategy. And now we need some of the resources to actually start winning. Um, and I've, um, I'll mention one more thing. Block Building Leadership Organizing Communities is a national network of young activists and organizers of color who we're trying to help support to build networks in their communities to, to figure out how to support each other in, in leading a progressive movement that includes our white allies and includes other folks in the community. So that's something that if folks want to know more about, I'll be around and have information about. But that's um, some of the things that we're involved in. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Andy? Hi. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Youth United for Change, but I kind of want to um, explain that what I do is I'm an organizer. I have the title of Assistant director but, director, but I'm a community organizer. And what I do is I train high school students to build power, to demand changes within the Philadelphia school system. And I go into high schools um, and bring young people together and connect them to people in power and train them to make some changes. And we're all going to make excuses for why we're scatterbrained tired from planes, but our school district just recently got completely privatized. And that was a huge, um, a huge organizing struggle that we're kind of still in the midst of. But I want to talk a little bit about the work that the students were doing before the privatization, because I think it's so key um, that when we organize and we work towards social change that we're not always reactionary. And we kind of take step backs and start, and kind of what Tosh said about framing the rules, but framing what we want and not just say what we don't want. We don't want that. We don't want Edison schools. We don't want privatization, but this is what we want. And students have begun to do that before the privatization effort. And part of the, some of the things that they were demanding were multicultural education. But multicultural education from a as my students would say, social action approach. They're quoting people like James Banks, um, who, who talks about multicultural education, learning histories and learning math and science and learning um, English from different perspectives from different people, not just this kind of one story that's being taught out there that engages young people um, towards social action and doesn't make people feel so powerless when it comes to changing things. Oftentimes we're taught as people of color that we're bad, lazy, stupid, passive, that we didn't resist any form of oppressions. 
all this to maintain the status quo. And when young people start to learn about their history from different perspectives, from perspectives from people that they can relate to, they start to realize that they can be agents of change. And they started to develop documents that I have here um, and, and take it around town and say, this is the type of education that we want. We want math and science that relates to our history and culture. We don't want to learn just the, the institutional science that's out there, the, the lab coat and the glasses, but we want to learn about environmental racism and we want to learn about um, Native American science that was there here before other, other forms of science were imposed on us. And so young people started to really look at teaching and learning in the classroom, because what happens is there's all these policies up there in the school district, and multicultural education is a policy that the school district has to have. And books like Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States are on their reading lists, and all these things exist out there, but what actually happens in the classroom is not they're not reading Howard Zinn. They're not, they're not involved in interactive education. They're not um, learning in the ways that they want to learn and need to learn. And there's a disconnect. So young people started saying, well, let's organize to kind of make that connect, and let's organize to make teaching and learning better um, by trying to form student-teacher alliances and do different things at their school. Um, and I wanted to say, because uh, President Tatum talked about her quote earlier about taking a picture, and one of our students had seen her speak, and she uses this whenever she speaks about multicultural education, about the picture. And if I take this picture and I mail it to you, and you don't see yourself in it, you're going to say, what's wrong with this picture? But if every picture you get you're not in, you're going to say, what's wrong with me? And her attitude is, I'm tired of wondering what's wrong with me, because it's not me that's the problem. It's the system that we live in that holds me down. And so they've used this quote that she just said earlier today to kind of promote multicultural education. And then came the state, <laughs> who said that the quality of education in Philadelphia was god awful took over our school district and has privatized 70 of our schools. So now we find ourselves in a situation where these private corporations are bringing in these cookie cutter curriculums. Any work that we've gained um, over the past couple years around teaching and learning is out the door. And um, this is happening in majority um, schools only 2% of the schools have majority white populations. This is happening in majority schools of people of color, primarily because of the large Title I budgets that they have, because that's the best way to make some money off of education. And it's based on that, not test scores like they claim. So young people now find themselves reacting to and, and playing by somebody else's rules. Um, instead of framing what we want, they find themselves saying, well, now we know what we don't want. And they're losing by framing it that way. And so at Youth United for Change, we decided to take a couple steps back and say, OK, instead of we have to deal with the issue of privatization, but instead of reacting and losing, um, we want to go back to framing what we want out of our education and what we need out of our education and just say, this is what we want, which includes not to be privatized, and move forward on that. But young people are the ones that are leading the struggle. Young people are the ones that are determining the issues. My role as an organizer is not to speak for them. And in fact, I'd wanted to bring a young person with me to speak about what they're doing, um, and unfortunately could not. But it's not about me speaking for them. It's about them coming up and speaking for themselves and determining the issues, and me just being a facilitator. And that's my role as an organizer. I'm 30 years old. I'm not young. I like to say I'm young, but I'm not as young as my, my needs are different than high school students' needs are. My issues are different than high school students are. And a lot of us tend not to listen and, and, and assume that as somebody who's graduated from school and you know been organizing for a long time and come from a left family that I know what young people need, as opposed to kind of taking a step back and supporting them as they develop their own issues and fight for them. So. <laughs> yeah, Didn't even need the notice here. Right. I guess youth is relative, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Ying Sun. Uh, hi, my name is Ying Sun Ho. I'm from the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Um, and in talking about this question of the relationship between a politics of race and a politics of solidarity, uh, I want to I talk about two different vantage points from which each is a prerequisite for the other. 
the first is theoretical. If you just think about race, you can't have a race-based organization or a race-based movement or a race-based formation of any kind unless it's a coalition, unless it's a coalition between, for instance, if you're talking about Asian people, Asian men and Asian women, Asian queers and Asian straight people, Asian working class people and Asian middle class people. You know what I'm saying? So by its very nature, race-based organizing calls for a coalitional politic, calls for a politic of solidarity. It calls for solidarity between these different groups within a race. So that's one angle. The second angle is strategic. We're in a fundamental contradiction between the ruling elite and the masses of people in the United States and the masses of people in the world, where the ruling elite is constantly exploiting and oppressing the masses of people and making money off it and maintaining their power off it while most people in the world suffer. In that kind of situation, in order for the masses of people to actually attain real freedom, real justice, real, uh, real peace and, and safety, the strategy has to be to isolate the opponent and to build as broad a base on your side as possible. In order to do that, you're going to need solidarity among different groups that become fragmented within that broad front. There's simply no way around that. If you're going to get to real justice, you need to isolate the enemy and build your front. So from that angle as well, the two are prerequisite, prerequisites for one another. But I want to talk, I want to make three points briefly about what that solidarity looks like and how you build it. Solidarity is an, an important and central idea and term, but there's a lot of room for what that could possibly mean. And I want to talk about what I think is the most relevant kind of solidarity, which is solidarity and fighting. Um, a lot of people um, talk about solidarity in service provision or solidarity in sort of word as opposed to in deed. But what I think is important in order for people to really build power within their communities is to fight against their enemies, to build organizations to fight against their enemies. We call these fighting organizations. Um, so in order to do that, you need to be working on the ground with people from affected communities, like Andy was talking about. So for instance, um, I'm a founding member of a group called Let's Get Free. Let's Get Free originally came together as an activist collective that worked on the case to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, which I'm hoping you're all familiar with and I don't have to talk about it great length. Um, over several years, Let's Get Free has now transformed into an organization that's predominantly working class youth of color working in their neighborhoods in Oakland fighting around issues of police and prisons and how police and prisons are tearing apart poor and working class communities of color in Oakland. That's a very different slant than an activist collective. But what it allows you to do then is, is build one, build power and leadership with, with the actually affected people, and then two, by rooting it in the communities, it then gives you a practical basis for solidarity, not just a, a rhetorical or a theoretical basis for solidarity, but actually we're all about to be locked up or we're all getting beaten up by the police. We all have a stake in this. That's a very different kind of claim, a very different kind of fight. The second point I want to make is around the relationship between fighting and power building and policy reform. I think a mistake a lot of people fighting for social justice make is to err on the side of policy reform in terms of their goals, in terms of their vision. I think that, I think that US history has made abundantly clear that policy reform without power building is ultimately a failing strategy. It's ultimately a losing strategy. If you look at the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement was destroyed because the government was able to make enough pacifying policy reforms while at the same time destroying the power building of the strongest organizations through infiltration, sabotage, and murder. If that's the case, then, then you look 20 years later and you have communities of color absolutely disorganized relative to what 
could have been projected in, say, 66, 67, 68. If you're in 66, 67, 68, and you don't know that your power base is about to be decimated and you're about to be pacified with policy reforms that actually don't go anywhere, you've got a much different vision of where your communities could actually be in 2002. But because policy reform was able to trump power building, the movement was decimated. So if, if you look at what we're doing in the Bay Area right now, one of, the, one of the central fights in the Bay Area right now is that Alameda County, which is the county that Oakland's in, is trying to build one of the largest per capita juvenile halls in the entire country, despite the fact that juvenile crime and juvenile delinquency has been on the decline for the last decade. We have an opportunity now, based on the, the organizing that we've done and the advocacy and activism that we've done, to engage in a series of dialogues with officials and bureaucrats and elites about nitty gritty policy stuff, or we could focus on building power among, the, among youth in Alameda County um, and among youth allies in Alameda County. We are choosing very deliberately to focus on power building because if you don't have power, you can't enforce any policy reforms that you get. Mm -hmm. So if we get the perfect policy passed by Alameda County and we're demobilized and we're focusing on talking to bureaucrats instead of talking to our people, how are we going to make them do what they say they're going to do? Brown versus Board of Education sounds good, doesn't actually get you anywhere when you don't have a power base to enforce it. So that's the second point I want to make is around policy and power. And the third point I want to make is more about how solidarity happens. And this focuses on more of the work that I'm personally involved in right now. Um, I'm a founder of a record label called Freedom Fighter Music, and I'm also a founding member of, as I said, Let's Get Free. These two uh, organizations or groups um, uh, approach their work as a meld or a, a marriage of organizing on the one hand and culture and art on the other hand. Um, in Freedom Fighter Music, we try and put out the most relevant and most truthful culture to our people because that is simply denied to us in mainstream media and mainstream culture. With that, we feel like our people can use the truth like a weapon. We can arm our people with the truth and then they can fight with that and then with also, of course, organization against our enemies. The second thing, Let's Get Free, is focuses on organizing. It's an organizing organization. But it uses culture as a way to bring people in, as a way to make sense of relatively complicated ideas and also relatively hidden ideas, ideas that are hidden from people throughout their lives and are masked and mystified throughout their <coughs> lives. With, by using the culture that's relevant to young people, in, in our case, uh, specifically urban and hip-hop culture, it's, we're able to make sense of it, make it exciting, make it fun, and make it relate to the rest of their lives, to, to the totality of young people's lives. That puts us in a position then to build solidarity among these different people through the thread of culture. So if you see these, these different people and even the different parts of the individuals as fragmented patches, with culture, we, we can use culture as a thread to sew these things together into a cohesive organization that can actually fight for power. Thank you. Carol. What uh, I want to do is, is just tell a, a couple of stories um, that grew out of the work that, that Lonnie and I did uh, in writing the book and learning where the politics that we're describing in the book is actually happening. Um, because the, uh, I've had some people say that the idea of the, of Solidarity that we describe in the book is utopian, and uh, my answer is that it's not utopian, it's just reporting. Uh, and it may not be exactly where we think it needs to get, but the idea is out there afoot already. So I want to tell just, just uh, three stories and, and uh, talk about this. The, the first story involves organizing at a Kmart plant in North Carolina. There, the, uh, the workers at a Kmart plant that was about 65% black uh, were getting about $5 per hour on average less than uh, workers at other Kmart plants around the, the, the country. A uh, union decided that it would be a good place to organize uh, around that and started a, an organizing struggle. It quickly became clear 
through the process, and this was a long period, I'm going to tell it very quickly, but it's a long period, that the, the organizing struggle would not succeed unless the union could figure out a way to engage race because without engaging race, they had no way, of, no effective way of joining the interests of the white workers and the black workers together, since the language of class, especially the language in the cla of class in the South, has always been the language that's divided poor white people from uh, black people. And over a, a long and concerted struggle, the uh, black workers and the, uh, the uh, ministers, black ministers, put together a, an analysis of what was going on with the Kmart plant that resonated through the experience of race for the black uh, workers, but also resonated to the rest of the community. Because what became clear as they had community meetings was that the $5 an hour that wasn't going in the pocket of the workers at the Kmart plant also wasn't getting spent in the stores in Greensboro, wasn't uh, contributing to uh, uh, services in Greensboro, and that the entire community was poor because of the way the workers in this plant were treated and, because the, and the plant owners felt they could get away with it because they were black workers. The plant thought it could divide the workers and the community by inscribing the old vision of race, the old class vision of race that divided, divided working class white people from working class black people. And so uh, in a prayer protest against the, uh, the factory there, the uh, plant owners, the corporate owners, uh, sued the black workers for trespass. And they thought, they thought that they had, by doing that, they had chased all the black people out of that struggle. And then a funny thing happened. What happened was the, another set of black workers got up and said, you know, you ought to arrest us too. But it, they couldn't see these other black workers because they were white. And when the white workers got up and said, we are doing exactly the same thing that the black workers are doing, and you need to recognize that we're in this struggle together, that was a moment in which a kind of solidarity was created of the type we're talking about. But you needed race to highlight the story that was being imposed to divide this community. And without race, you wouldn't have had that kind of x-ray vision Right, that allowed these white workers to see that, in fact, they were black too. <clears throat> Second story. There's a place in L.A. Uh, called the Cornfield. It, L.A. is a park poor place. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the powers that be, including uh, Latino powers that be, wanted to create an industrial park in this area called the Cornfield. I don't know about it. Uh, it was an area that was uh, white, uh, uh, Latino, Asian, primarily Asian. The communities, the Latino community, the white environmental community, and the Asian community organized to prevent the development of that area. And they stopped the, the, the cornfield and had a commitment from the city to turn it into parkland. Uh, one of their theories was that parks are public places. And it's not a, their theory, it's a theory about parks, right? Parks are places where communities get together and create themselves. And that's one of the primary functions that parks serve. So the, this coalition came together to stop that development. You might remember last summer there was an energy crisis in California. And Gray Davis thought that the way to solve this energy crisis was to build another power plant. And he was going to build another power plant in a place where most of the power is being used in Southern California. And he was going to locate this power plant in a park. And the park he was going to locate it in was the only park in a the black, major black community in LA. This 
Governor Davis thought was a slam dunk. <laughs> right, I'm going to put the, this power plant <coughs> here. We're going to solve the energy crisis, and the community's not going to complain. But the community did complain, and the community that complained was the same community that opposed the development of the cornfield. And it was a struggle in developing that cross-racial coalition around parks that stood up for the black community in that instance. Now, if you can imagine what it took, right, this was stopping the building of a power plant when Californians were going nuts. Now, we, of course, realized, uh, looking back on it, that the power uh, shortage was actually occurring in Houston and not in, uh, uh, in California. Oh, it was too much power in Houston. Uh, uh, <laughs> they were sucking all the power <laughs> to Houston, right? Um, so that's the, the, sec the second story. The third story, right, is how that coalition got created in the first instance. It got created out of the bus rider strike in LA. LA, you know, is building a subway system. It's a great idea. Like, it's like, I can't even remember what it is. It's like a bazillion dollars a mile. I mean, it's a really expensive uh, 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 project. But, you know, I don't want to oppose subways. Subways are, are good. I like subways. <laughs> but on the other hand, the money to pay for it had to come from someplace. And where it was coming from were, were buses, right? And the, the, the transportation that working people used. And the reduction in services of bus led to a bus rider strike. Now, again, here, the powers that be thought they could make a division between black people who were the drivers of the bus and unionized and the riders of the bus who were primarily Latino, many uh, undocumented. Right? And it was the coalition between the black bus drivers and the Latino bus riders that joined together in a suit to stop the expenditure on the subway and to focus it on the needs of the community that resulted in a settlement that gave rise to EJLA, that ultimately gave rise to the stopping of the cornfield, that ultimately gave rise to the stopping of that power plant in uh, Baldwin Park. All of those are examples of how you needed to use race to build a politics of solidarity. And that's the kind of thing that's happening out there. It's not made up. Right? It's, it's out there. And the experiments that are happening at local levels all around the country are the things that, uh, and Lonnie, I'll spit I'll, 10 seconds more. Lonnie, you had this line in the book that I kept crossing out and she kept writing back in, and I kept crossing out and she kept writing back in. Uh, and finally, you know, you know Lonnie, so she won. Uh, uh, our hearts are bursting with optimism, or overflowing with optimism. I can't even remember, I crossed out so many times. <laughs> Brimming with optimism. And you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Reflecting on what's happening out there, you had to be optimistic, right? And, and power, to get back to your point, power comes out of a belief that you can make the future, that you can make the future, that the future doesn't make you. And it's grasping the future that I, I think enlivens the power and the struggles that we've seen ar around the country. Great, thank you. Well, we've had an excellent framing for the discussion to come now, and uh, um, Taj began by arguing that um, you have to organize to change the rules, uh, and that that focuses on building power through building leadership and developing community. Uh, Andy argued that you have to not only oppose, but, but construct a, a vision of what it is that you want to make happen, not only what you want to stop happen. And that, that uh, and, and as illustration of that, uh, the multicultural, the struggle over multicultural education, which can or, which may or may not include a social action dimension uh, or not. Um, oh, and also, uh, Taj also made the point that to really look at uh, solidarity and politics of race, you have to look at them together as one and the same. Ying Sun argued that they're preconditions of one another, um, arguing both from the, the standpoint, uh, a practical standpoint, uh, in terms of what's, what's required for coalition, 
and a theoretical standpoint of what it takes to build a majority, but also wanted us to f pay particular attention to the difference between policy reform uh, and power and organizing strategies as ways of achieving change. Um, and uh, also made the point that coalition is born out of shared struggle. Uh, Gerald then gave us three illustrations of Yingson's point uh, around a struggle around work, uh, a struggle around recreation and open space, and a struggle around transportation. All three of which here at the Kennedy School we're used to looking at as policy problems, but which Gerald put in the context of being power problems. Power problems that were opportunities to act on what the other panelists have argued is a way to act. So now we want to open it up to everyone here. Uh, comments, questions, challenges. Uh, there's a mic there. There's a mic there. Uh, and so uh, have at it. Oh, everyone's agrees, and this is just no, there's not going to be any debate here. OK. And, um, and please uh, give us your name and, and what you, where you're from or you know, how you happen to be here. OK, thank you. Um, my name is Catherine. I'm from the Kennedy School and from the UK originally. Um, this is a question for the um, gentleman from Let's Get Free. Um, and you talked a lot, well, you talked several times about having an enemy. Um, and I wondered if I could just press you to elaborate a bit on who the enemy is, because it's something that, you know, I, I actually sort of find a little alarming. Um, and maybe that's because I'm white, but then I'm an outsider because I'm a woman and I'm foreign, or, you know, my parents were refugees, or because I'm a feminist, or ever. Um, and I just, I feel like there's a, a danger in having a monolithic other, and that could be a monolithic other who's a person of color, or somebody who's, I don't know if your enemy is somebody who's a white, middle-aged man, who's a rapist, who works in the private sector and doesn't care about anybody. I mean, is there really an enemy? Um, so when I was talking about uh, opposition to enemy and sort of conflict and contradiction within society, uh, I was talking about, and I think I, I said a little bit about this. My, my understanding from the study that I've done and from sort of what I've gone through in my life is that there are people, there are a small number of people who have a vested interest in oppression of masses of people and exploitation of masses of people on various axes, whether those be gender, sex, uh, sexuality, Class, race, uh, region—a number of different, a number of different uh, axes. I think, in general, that the people who have power on those various axes actually converge to a small number of people. I think, for the masses of people, it's a mistake not to see that as as a real contradiction and see those as people who have a real vested interest that are that are contradictory to ours. That we actually have a vested interest in being free. In, in having justice, in having adequate health care, adequate housing, uh, adequate food, and that those people profit off of creating a system and maintaining a system and profiting off a system that denies us those things. So when I say enemy, that's, that's what I mean. Anyone else want to comment on the yeah, enemy question? Yeah, yeah I, I guess I'd say that, that, that if you think the, the primary thing we're struggling against is the, is the or at least speaking for myself, um, is the, uh, the ideology that naturalizes inequality and accepts it as the way things are. And I, 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 you know, I wrote Marshall an email about this, right? I mean, I grew up, I was born in Victorville in the high desert and moved in, in, to San Bernardino, the real California. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they, and, and the reason, and that was my, so my father had to commute 45 miles to work. And the reason he had to move for, commute 45 miles to work is when he came back from the war in World War II, he couldn't buy a house in his hometown. Uh, and so it pissed him off. And so he left, right? But he never generalized from that experience to the social critique, right? And the ideology that prevented him from generalizing from, prevented him from generalizing from that experience is what we have to struggle against. Now, it has institutional forms. Right? As, it's not just an idea. It has institutional forms. You've got to struggle against the institutional form of the idea, of that expression. Anyone else? I, I think it's important to remember that at the same time that we're trying to help people to not look at blame the canary for the problems in the mine, we have to understand that 
that's a, it's a structural problem and it's an institutional problem and it's a problem of, in my experience, a cultural system which is hegemonic if we want to start throwing around the words like that. Um, but that's the problem, and, the, and the, that's the problem for the miner, and that's the problem from the canary. And the miners didn't create the mine. They were interpolated into the mine in the same way that the canary was interpolated into the mine. And so power is more complicated, and when we, sometimes when we, for all of us who are implicated in these relationships of power and domination, and we're all exploiting each other in various ways, and that's not to minimize the fact that I agree with Ying Sun, based on the system as it is, there is a very small group of people who are disproportionately benefiting to the, at the expense of the rest of us. And that's just a fact. But, but the point is that it's a structural problem. It's not about those individual people. And when our response is individual and we start to feel guilty, we're actually feeding the system. We're actually allowing the system to perpetuate those relationships of power as opposed to saying, where did that come from? How did I end up in this position? And what power do I have to dismantle this system that I was born into and, and shoved into? Because we were all shoved into it one way or the other. And, and once we have awareness about how it functions, then we have choice. We can take action to use our power to change it. And I think that that's the response that the book is trying to promote, and that's one I hope we take up. Andy, did you want to? Based on a discussion we had earlier, my great-grandfather was an Irish socialist uh, coal miner, actually, in central Pennsylvania. So the miner's canary, I knew exactly what it was as soon as I heard <laughs> the title of the book. Um, and so kind of on the enemy thing and just kind of backing up what Taj was saying as well, um, no, it's not the canary, it's not the mine. It is the owner, though. And that is the enemy. <laughs> and coming from a tradition of, of, of supporting the Molly Maguires, and, you know, it, it is the owner. And there is, there is people who benefit from, from the system that the way it is. There's people who benefit from our young people not being educated. There's people who benefit from our young people being incarcerated and adults being incarcerated and people of color. Um, there are people who benefit from things being divided and not united, from schools divided into tracks to you know, societies divided among race. And people benefit from that. And those, that, to me, is the enemy. Up there? Hi. <clears throat> um, Tell us your name and where you're My from. name is Naj Manazia. I'm from Boston. Um, I want to, I have a challenge too, and I hope to get an answer for, from it. Um, my challenge would be that in this <clears throat> like new world in time, as we stand right now, child soldiers, street children, child prostitution, prevalent, not just for children here, children being in prison here, but like children everywhere in the world, right? Young people of color, but also like young people who are oppressed and this and that. We need a new analysis. The, I sat through two panels in which people keep on talking about civil rights, civil rights, civil rights, and even I wonder, ooh, where that comes from? That doesn't sound too heavy. But <clears throat> to hear stuff that um, can sound so radical, but isn't so radical when you are talking about raising activists, and raising movement and helping young people become leaders and build power base beyond like policy. You know, what, what is the theory in the analysis that's gonna move us forward? Because civil rights theory doesn't apply to, I also sat through two panels today that were all people of color, you know, and so there are some things that are very different now, just not applicable to some of that analysis, but it keeps on seeping in to this conversation. So I want to know what theory and analysis is new that applied to a new movement, new young people, new children everywhere. Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> All right. I, like, I, don't, okay. I, I mean, I don't know what's I know. new. I mean, right. I, <clears throat> but I know what I've seen and I know what I've experienced. And so I, I mean, I can, I can speak to that. I mean, I think that what's new to me in thinking about, um, I think, in our experience in the Bay Area, young people think about race in a different way. Young people are coming together in a different way that their parents came together or their parents came together. And because of that, they're able to organize and work together in a way and build culture in a way that allows them to, to take action, collective action together in a way that's, that's inspiring. And when I think about the young people that I've worked with and our generation sort of moving forward, we're going to bring that new perspective and that new experience into the work that we do, into the institutions that we build, into our families, into the communities that we build. So I think that a lot of what's new is coming from the lived experience of young people as they try to negotiate 
this post-civil rights reality. Um, I think that's one thing that's new. I think, theoretically, one of the things that's inspired me, and I got a chance to, to write a little bit about with, with a woman named Kim McGillicuddy for a publication called uh, The Nonprofit Quarterly, which Kenny edited, um, is looking at the example of the street children's movement in Brazil. I think when we look at social movements in this country, I think we need to look at examples in other places because um, there's a lot that can be drawn from there. And one of the things that you look at when you, you look at um, the situation of the, the fact that there are in Brazil um, lots of, of young people, street children, who the vast majority are race black, and, and we know in Brazil, the blacker you are, the, the more economically and socially disadvantaged you are. That's a fact, it's the, the, despite the myth of the racial democracy. Um, but you have basically a group of young people who are the most marginalized people in this society, who with the support of adults, who came to them and simply said, what is it that you need? What is it that you want to do? And help them to build their own organizations, which they controlled. And those young people went on to take over the Congress develop, write their own policy, and, um, and get it implemented, and, 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 and got the, the government to ratify the, um, the um, UN Charter on the Rights of the Child. So I think that, that there are examples there, there are examples in South Africa, there are examples elsewhere that we can look to where I think we can find the theory and the practice about what's new about this moment, that it's coming from the practice. <laughs> it may it may also be that uh, it takes new practice to generate new theory. Uh, and maybe some of what we're hearing about is new practice. Right. I, I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that I, I'll just make a small point, right, is that, is that in describing the moment we're in as post-civil rights, wh what that means is we're past the uh, uh, diagnosis of the problem as it was when the civil rights movement started. Not that we're past racism or we're past um, uh, the use of uh, the kind of the conditions of racialized people to divide material goods, right? But but we're past kind of the Jim Crow era. We're past the era when it was a moral issue. And what Lonnie and I have tried to do in this book is to suggest that in fact there's a there's a politics that have to be developed around that struggle. And in fact, the politics is going to flow from the practice as much as the reverse. My name is Aaron Schultzcoat. Uh, I also have a challenge that's and based- And you're from? Harvard. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I also have a question that's based on, or a challenge that's based on the question of newness. It seems to me, albeit in different ways, each of you um, makes a sort of underlying assumption that if through a coalitionary politics that was somehow able, able to overcome the one-sidedness of labor approaches that fail to ground themselves in sort of a politics of difference and uh, new social movements which fail to provide an adequate class-based analysis, that some organizational form of organizing, even if it were power-based, would eliminate the problems that attempts to create an interracial progressive movement of the poor and working classes in the United States have run up. Uh, against in history. And the challenge that I want to bring is that I'm wondering whether such an organizational form really would overcome the challenges that um, an interracial movement of the poor have, or efforts to create an interracial movement of the poor have faced throughout history. And the particular things, or US history, and the particular things I'm thinking about um, are twofold. On the one side, issues of fragmentation, displacement, like an inability to really approach the fundamental causes of oppression. Um, and yeah, also uh, on, on the other side of it, just the possibility of creating real change, whether the fundamental question of whether if one were to be able to build an interracial movement of the poor, would that really affect fundamental change that you're actually hoping for? Um, these are problems that have come up throughout U.S. history, and I'm really wondering why you think uh, a new sort of seemingly new coalitionary solidarity politics will actually be able to approach these questions in new ways. Okay, who'd like to take that? I'd be glad to talk about. It. I want to, you know, I mean, part of one one of the things that we've left out or haven't or is actually carried over from the first panel. Right, is that is that one of the, the key elements it's not just coalitionary politics, it's coalitionary democratic politics. Right. So that 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 uh, a full blown democratic movement right, implies uh, a re 
uh, uh, coming to grips with the way that power is distributed. So it, it means confronting power as one of the issues. Um, that the, the, the mere uh, you know, change of complexion of the movement isn't enough. Right? It might be an expression of uh, engagement with the issue of power, but it's not enough. And, and the, the democratic component is a critical component. I mean, the, you know, it's, is it, is it going to be automatic? No, of course not, right? It, it, it is, a, is, a, is a, you know, uh, you know lib liberation a, you know, a, a necessary precipitate of this? Not necessarily, you know, but, it, but it's, it, it, there is a grounds to struggle, right? And that's the key, I think. Tough. I think one of the questions that you raised was what organizational form? And I think part of the reasons why we don't have effective movements right now is that we, we look for single organizations to do too much. And, and organizations aren't movements. Organizations are part of the infrastructure that allows movements to happen, but it's only a part of it. And so I think that, I think that part of the challenge is, like, like I said before, changing the way that we think about organizations so that, that, um, that movements are more possible. And I, and I sort of have a basic belief based on my lived experience that um, as I, I think we're living in a society in a, in, a, in a way of life, a form of life that's pretty unsustainable. And it's already unsustainable for most of the world. And it's becoming increasingly unsustainable sustainable for the small percentage of us who are shielded from its costs and its effects in large part. And so that's a basic fact that we as people are going to have to answer. We're going to have to figure out how we live together and have relationships and families and communities and organizations that are functional and healthy. And that's something we have to figure out how to do if we're going to make a world that, that works for folks. And, and part of building a new social movement is doing that. And we've, we have lessons from the past that, that I think we're learning from. And we're not making the same mistakes that we've made before, which is another thing that, um, that gives me hope. Um, Just one comment. Uh, it's also worth just looking at the demographics. Uh, I mean, we're on the threshold of a dramatic dem demographic change of, of who's the majority in this country. And you take a look at, Los at California and at Los Angeles, I mean, maybe that's one reason everybody's from out there. You get a preview uh, of what's to come in which white and majority don't equal the same thing. Now, they do still, but they don't in California anymore. And this opens up a whole new set of possibilities in terms of racial configurations and even the meaning of race itself uh, that I think we'd be wise to really pay attention to. Because to the extent that race has been one of the bedrock categories of American politics, it's under assault now from the changing practice and reality that's emerging, particularly you see it in the West. Uh, but we'll see it throughout the country. And that, that'd be one thing that yeah. I'd suggest. And, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, an example from Texas, right, the, the, um, in, from Texas history, uh, and, and I, I don't mean to, I talk a lot about Texas because I'm there and it occupies my mind. Uh, um, the, the banking rules in early Texas were such that, that uh, banks could give different rates to different people. So they'd give one rate to black sharecroppers, they'd give a rate, another rate to Mexicans, they'd give another rate to, me to Mexicans who were like, white Mexicans as opposed to brown Mexicans. Uh, and then when, when, when there was an influx of poor whites from the, the south into Texas, the, the, there was a, a problem because these people became competitors for, uh, in the productive process. And because you were, you were using race as a division uh, for economic reasons, they, if they couldn't just give the black rate to these poor whites. So they had to develop a theory Right. And the theory was eugenics. Right. And, and Tom Green and the, the idea that, well, these, were, these aren't really white people. They're, because they're, they're, they're kind of degraded white people. So they're really, they're really more like Mexicans or blacks. Right. And so we can give them the same rates, the banks can give them the same rates. Right. Now that worked, right, as a way to, to, you know, and then they could also say to these poor white people, but you're not really, you know, you don't, you don't have to go to school with them, right? Because you're not really black, but, but you're not really white. Right? And that worked to divide the, co the race work both to protect the banker's position and to divide the coalition that co started to be created in some parts of Texas and then 
the old racial story was used to divide it. Well, you know, that's not true in Texas anymore, right? I mean, Texas, uh, one of the interesting things that happened this last election, uh, and I don't mean to focus on elections, right? But it's, you know, Ron Kirk is the, is the, is the candidate for Senate from, from Texas. Running again, he ran against Victor Morales, right? And Tony Sanchez is the is the Democratic governor uh, candidate for governor, um, and people were concerned that that Kirk's candidacy would that that would divide the black and the brown community. And in fact, the question the organizers the 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 Chicano, the Chicano leadership basically said, no, you know what we've got to do is Kirk's the best candidate, and it's this is not about racial politics. This is about the substantive politics, and, and that's why we're, we want you to support Kirk, even though, you know, if we were just doing racial politics, we would have had you vote for Morales. It was just the same story in Chicago in the Harold Washington campaign, right? That, that you know, the, that they need, people needed to build coalitions beyond identity politics in order to engage power. Now, we have a lot of people at yeah. mics, and so we're going to ask, we're going to go back oh. around, and please keep the questions brief and, and the answers keep brief. the responses. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Gerald. You're way ahead of me. All right, let's go over here. Hi, my name is Emily Whiting. I'm a master's in public administration student here at the Kennedy School, um, most recently living in Minneapolis. And um, I have been a social worker and a community organizer, both in my own queer community, but also in other uh, communities of color in various parts of the country. My question uh, for you all comes from that part of community organizing of myself. Um, I have noticed within my own community and other oppressed communities that there tends to be um, a myopia that is born from the struggle to just survive on a daily basis. And by myopia, I'm talking about with regards to solidarity politics. Uh, working across communities, feeling comfortable with having other people coming into your community as an ally, uh, having comfortable expressing your solidarity with other communities around uh, issues that, that they deem important to work on. Um, my question for you is, have you got any ideas about um, a prescription to correct that myopia? How to make people feel more comfortable as we move forward, um, struggling together to make the world a better place? Anyone want to respond? Um, so I'll respond a little bit. I think, I think this comes back, uh, at least part of the answer, to this is obviously not the complete answer to how to, how to solve such a big problem. But I think part of the answer comes back to what um, Professor Gann said earlier, which is that theory flows from practice. And I think that that can be brought in generally to that thought and ideas flow from practice and doing. I think a lot of the, the things that have come up in the, in the more recent questions can come back to this. For me, in thinking about solidarity and in thinking about building alliances, the most important place to build that is not rhetorical, it's practical. The most important place to build that is not ideological. It's actually in on the ground work in fighting for change. Um, the, reason, the reason that I think that, that fighting against oppression and exploitation is not just important for certain groups of people, but is actually important for the vast majority of people, is that I think it actually impacts all of these people's lives. I don't think it's like, wouldn't it be nice if people got together, that would be swell. I think that these things actually have concrete impacts on people's lives that are shared across these boundaries. So for instance, in San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area, police are simultaneously incredibly brutal towards young black men and incredibly brutal towards uh, uh, FTM transgender men of, of many races, but mostly of color and especially in the sex industry. That, the, the building solidarity between young men of color, especially young black men, uh, and FTM men is gonna most likely be characterized as an unlikely alliance. That that's not something that's probably just gonna happen naturally. But if you actually work on it and bring together people on the ground around similar fights and united fights against p the police department and what the police department is doing and trying to f advocate and find ways that the community can actually exercise power over what the police, d d the police department does and uh, exercise power and, uh, sorry, and hold 
the police department practically accountable, that's a forum where you can build practical solidarity and through that practice, people's understanding changes. I think people's understanding changes through actual lived experience. So if you can find issues that, that lend themselves to bringing people together in unlikely alliances, that's gonna go a long way, I think, towards being able to build um, political and ideological unity as well as practical unity. Thank you. Let's take another doing? question so we can just um, yeah. I missed a little bit of the conversation, but I have a couple of questions. And I, and I struggle personally with the idea of coalescing with different groups because for me personally, I feel like my community, the black community, that we've coalesced with so many groups so long that we forgot to help ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing for me that I feel that we need to take care of what's wrong in our community before we build bridges. But my, my other question is with this paradigm shift, because I think it's great that people can work together and if we take the race implications out of the United States, can we really shift the paradigm without really understanding some of the global implications of race? Like if we don't look at how our government gets involved in areas based on racial implications, you can see it in the West Bank, you can see it in Northern Africa, you saw it even in the Bosnian conflict. There are issues of color that are even pervasive outside in communities where we don't think they exist. How can we, how do we do that? Because in order, to me it seems like in order to shift the paradigm to get people to coalesce, that we have to really educate people on the realities of global race politics, not just race politics here in the states. Someone want to respond? You know, what we might do is take several questions, yeah, questions. and then, and then uh, uh, respond to them collectively. Shall we do that? Okay, let's, then let's move right over here. Uh, well, I think my question definitely ties in. And uh, first, my name is Troy Brown. I'm a joint degree student with the Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School of Government. Um, I'm not one to miss my words, so I'll be very blunt. Now, as I understand my history, race is definitely a, a construct as a means to divide all of us in the first place. And if we look at all across the world, uh, race-based and color-based systems of division, to me, kind of match the, the larger and looming, more ominous and more entrenched socioeconomic issues. So. To me, it seems kind of problematic that we're trying to uh, collectivize along racial issues. So if we're talking about the world, most of the world's poor. And wherever the European has gone, he's imposed these color and race-based <laughs> systems of division. Mm -hmm. So if we all have more in common as far as us being poor and not having access to a more populous kind of democracy that we're all advocating for, why are we aligning ourselves along the issues of race? I think race is important as far as healing. Uh, with, within a community and between communities, but I don't think it should be the, the basis for kind of collective action. And if we're, just to get a little more philosophical about this, and I don't want to, but if we're looking at things from a very rosy and veil of ignorance type of thing, that would exclude morally relevant features like race in the first place and get to the more important issues like why don't I have access to these things? So it seems what we're talking about is a renegotiation of the social contract, and that can only happen if there is a a renewed parity, since there's never been a parity in the first place. So I don't understand why we'd attempt to, how can I say, uh, align ourselves with those who have tried to oppress us for a very long time until we can look him face to face as an equal, especially since I think we're, as a community, peoples of color, and that's what I mean, are more than capable at this point of essentially creating these things ourselves. And until we can do that, I don't think there's a point even trying to uh, go beyond uh, the color, non-color distinction. Okay, over here. I guess my question kind of relates to that. I mean, in a way, okay, so Taj mentioned how now we have strategy, we don't have resources. I mean, as communities of color, a lot of times we don't have resources and we need to align ourselves to like white liberal organizations. But I mean, <laughs> and in order to, you know, like to engage interest, in, in, to engage resources, you need to align interests, then how do you build coalitions without shifting your leadership and shifting your interests? And like, I wonder if, if people can talk about their experiences and how they get out of that, how they deal with it. Okay, and over here. 
Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm a junior at the college. Um, my question is less direct to what people have been saying, but more direct to student-led movements within Harvard campus. Um, and right now, there's a broad-based coalition movement to diversify Harvard's curricula. Um, as you can imagine, West and Appiah's departures made students very fearful of the fate of the African-American department, of the Harvard administration's attitude towards issues of ethnic curricula and diversifying the curricula. And my question is, how do we relate these student movements towards wanting Latino student studies, wanting Native American studies, wanting Asian studies, um, um, with a larger question of social change, what is the value of diversifying curricula? Um, should we have a broader vision of how to integrate the curricula with the social change that you guys have been talking about? Um, and along those lines, if you guys want to come to a rally at 3 p.m. on Sunday, uh, it's in Go Harvard ahead. Yard in front of Weiner, and we're protesting the administration's indifference towards issues of diversity, and I hope to see you all there. Well, good. Let's take one more, and then we'll uh, go for a round of responses. Um, I wanted to actually move forward a little bit. We're talking a lot about strategy in terms of who should be involved, but my question is towards what end? I mean, I was involved in a conversation earlier about social justice when we were all a group of people talking about social justice, but I think there are assumptions about what that means. So I'm curious, what is your vision of what social justice means, particularly in terms of the distribution of wealth? <laughs> okay, we've got a bunch of topics on the table here. We still have a couple more questions, but um, who wants to take a shot at what's on the table right now? <laughs> We're all looking at each other. I'm like yeah. overwhelmed. There's a lot on the table. <laughs> Taj, why don't you, uh, why don't you start off? Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Um, you don't have to answer every one, but <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I guess feeling a little overwhelmed by a lot of the stuff. There's a lot of points on the table and talking a little bit about the politics, from the politics of, of unity to distribution of wealth. Um, there's a lot in between there. I guess for me, it's, it's easiest for me to discuss things as it relates to what I do every day. And um, in Pennsylvania, there's a joke that, well, it's not really funny, but between Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh lies Alabama. And so the reality is, is we have Republican governors, we have Republican um, um, and conservative uh, house. And when it comes to education, we're severely underfunded in the city of Philadelphia, which is one of the educational struggles within the city. And we're also severely, we're very powerless in an electoral sense, but not in a, as far as a, a people sense. Um, which is one of the issues with the whole privatization problem. Same with the rural areas. The rural areas in, in the state of Pennsylvania have underfunded educational systems, and they have, um, they have educational systems that are god-awful, and they have test scores similar to those inside the city of Philadelphia, as if test scores were a great indicator. Um, but there's no sitting down together. <laughs> Race, race is, is the dividing issue. There is no saying, my God, we all have this, this same self-interest of improving our educational system. Let's, let's work together to, to vote something through as they might have done in Texas. It's just not happening in the state of Pennsylvania. To the point where organizations like Good Schools Pennsylvania, run by the former superintendent of Philadelphia schools, is organizing in the rural areas and specifically staying away from Philadelphia so he's not associated with the city because then he won't get people to buy into trying to change the funding formula in the state of Pennsylvania. So I think like for organizations, that's where organizations can come into play. Can Youth United for Change and Good Schools Pennsylvania sit down and, and figure out some strategies and, and, and figure out a way to change the funding formula without having to, to particularly talk about race, even though it exists and it's there and, you know. But could, could you know, one of the students in my program sit down with a student in rural Pennsylvania at this point now? So I, I think like there's different issues of solidarity and there's different levels of solidarity. And to say that you know, self-interest is gonna kind of bind everybody together in a society that's divisive doesn't necessarily always work. But to say that there's ways in which it can be, if, if it's issue-based, be manipulated, then you know, there's ways to build power around that. And I guess I kind of, I heard a lot of themes around and it's based on a couple questions ago, but I wanted to, say that there's different ways of defining solidarity, because I think 
um, Professor Torres defined it as people standing together um, earlier in his stories about struggles in Texas and in Pennsylvania, it's not people standing together. It's, it's organizations that are figuring out ways to change the funding formula and not people that are marching arm in arm and walking together, so. Taj, you wanna say something? Cheryl? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the first two questions, the, the uh, what Lonnie and I argue, uh, one of the reasons that, that race remains a, a salient place for organizing is that they are, uh, racial, racialized communities are places where uh, uh, people ha have a sense of linked fate. And it's that sense of linked fate that uh, allows a politics to emerge that can empower a community and put it in a position where coalitions might be possible. But it's not about building a coalition in, in, uh, and ignoring the issues that are most important to a particular community. Um, race remains a, uh, a key indicator for how resources are divided in our society. And I think to ignore that is, 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 uh, uh, puts us at, at risk. For example, even uh, on the SAT was d discussed earlier, right? And the SAT was discussed in the context of measuring, of it measuring the, uh, the income of the parents of the student who's taking it. In fact, it's, it's deeper than that. It, 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 it's actually a, a better measurement of the wealth of the parents of the student who's taking it. So that if you have an African-American student and a, uh, a, a white student who both come from families that are earning $50,000 a year, the, the black family that's earning $50,000 a year has significantly less wealth, which is income congealed over generations. Right? So that, in fact, if the test is just measuring wealth, what you've got to do is you've got to ask, how can we interrogate the ways in which wealth is created and then ask what are the politics for making access to the, those mechanisms available to communities? So you get things like transfer payment reinvestment as, a, as the policy precipitate, for instance. Right? But, it's, but it comes from recognizing that race remains a salient factor for understanding the way goods are distributed. We're getting close to time, and so we have two more. And I thought we might get those questions and then give each panelist a couple of minutes to wrap up. Does that make sense? I mean, there's a very, it seems, though, there's a very important kind of unresolved tension that's floating around here that it would be useful to address and engage about, you know, under what circumstances does mobilizing on racial lines, uh, really is that the way to go, or is it not the way to go? Uh, and that question seems to be still sitting and floating out here, and uh, hopefully we'll address it more. Yes, Janice. Hi, my name is Janice Lee. I'm a youth organizer at the Boston Area Youth Organizing Project, so I really want to thank all of you for being here. I'm also an alum um, from 2000 from the Kennedy School. Um, I really am appreciating this conversation because I think that um, I've been forced, as I've entered from graduate school into the real world, to face the realities and the practicalities of doing some of the grandiose visions that I had here. Um, and I think that the challenges to really building multiracial coalitions are, are real. Yeah. Um, Boston is not California. When I walk into Dorchester High School, I'm usually the first Asian American that a lot of the African American Caribbean students have ever met. And um, that crossing that bridge to figure out that we actually do have an interest in common as people of color and in other ways is, is really sometimes, frankly, challenging. Um, and although I have some success stories, um, those struggles are still there. And so I have a lot of, of um, struggles that I'd want your strategies on, including that trust building between communities. Um, how I think one thing that blocks multiracial coalition building is just the limited resources that everyone feels like we're fighting for. Um, I think there's not very much space where a lot of this, a lot of the connection can happen. But there's one that I want to put out there to really get your um, input on. One real uh, question on our organization now is how do we prioritize the time we spend with communities that are white and well-resourced? 
um, because we have young people that we organized in, in well-resourced white communities as well. And I know that this is an issue raised in the book, um, Miners Canary, and I'm curious how all of you have handled that question. How do you prioritize the time and energy spent, you know, getting some really good resources from white, well-resourced communities? That's my question. Hi, my name is Lorelai Williams, and I'm a second year student at the Kennedy School. I've also been involved in uh, youth activism and organizing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Lisa Sullivan uh, was someone who also impacted my life a whole lot, and actually my question flows out of understanding a lot of the work she did and the role of faith in that work, because that's something I haven't really heard brought up as much. And um, so the question specifically is about strategy. I've heard a lot about kind of grassroots coalition building and specifically using organization as a kind of mechanism or a springboard for um, beginning to mobilize around social change issues. But I'm wondering where you all see the role of uh, spirituality or religion in terms of really informing, number one, the, the kind of material that people are made of in terms of giving them the energy to sustain this struggle for social justice. And also um, speaking to the people who are quote unquote enemies, not that I like that term either, but whoever you're trying to address your grievances to in terms of he helping them to understand their linked fate in terms of common humanity and things like that. So I know, you know, if you look towards Gandhi or uh, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, all of them really invoked faith in their work. And I, that's not something I heard as much about. And then the second part of that is um, in terms of using art as well as if I was really digging uh, Sing. Ying Sun. Sing, I'm sorry. Ying Sun. Ying Sun. Ying Sun, right. Uh, really digging the record company idea because I think a lot of times you get people that do not want to sit in a forum like this, to be quite honest, or don't want to go to a rally, or don't want to go to a meeting, and I think there are really important ways of kind of tapping into those internal places. And I was wondering if you guys could kind of talk about broadening, broadening the strategy in terms of looking at art and looking at the role of spirituality. Well, and uh, I've been handed a notice here to remind everyone to stay for performance by the Blackout Arts Black Collective. Out. It's hot. It's hot. Don't sleep on Blackout. It's hot. Don't sleep All on right, Blackout. So uh, that's very appropriate. So, okay. Uh, do, why don't we work our way back this way? Yeah, I, I think I think the 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 uh, I mean, cultural expression is is critical. I mean, I look to to Marshall's own experience, and the, I've talked to him about this before, right? In, in organizing the, 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 the farm workers, a critical element was, was the creation of El Teatro Campesino. Right? And the, El Teatro Campesino wasn't just the, the use or the creation of a new art form, but it, it empowered the community to, to, to work on issues right? and to think about policy without ever, think, without ever, without ever talking about it as policy. Right? It's, it's to, but to engage the issues uh, and the acto, right? the, the form, Right, which is now, you know, Dennis Valdez is now a you know, famous playwright. And, but but it, that's a one way in which culture emerged as a, as a kind of a critical element in, in the struggle. And if you look at, 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 uh, at the, the organizing in Greensboro, the, the ministers were critical to that activity. You look at, you look at, 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 the, at the, the civil rights movement and uh, the his, history of the civil rights movement, the, the, the churches, were critical, and, and you know, um, the the important thing I think for us to, to everyone to re re realize is that is that 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 we're here having this discussion today because of the gift that the civil rights movement and black people gave to us, right? And that's what enables us to think of what the next stage might be, or how you build coalitional politics, right? Uh, and the spiritual element of that is incredibly strong, right? And the cultural element is, is strong. Uh, and so, I mean, and, and you know, it's like, I, I'm a musician, right? So I, I'm into expressing this stuff culturally as well. Uh, and so I can, you know, appreciate that. Um, there's so many things still on the table, it's hard to think of what to say. Um, I wanna say a little bit about, I don't know if it got addressed, but the sister's question about um, shifts in leadership due to coalition building or solidarity politics. And I think when we think about, when we think about our fights and our allies, the, the struggles that we engage in and the allies that we engage in them with, um, we, should, we should be making distinctions between allies that are sort of, like if we think of our sort of long-term strategy and our long-term goals, allies that mesh with that and have a lot of unity with us on that, or allies that just have unity with us on sort of particular practical things. Um, and for right now, I just like to call the former strategic allies and the latter tactical allies. 
And when, you, when we think about leadership, we should be, in, in our struggles, we should be prioritizing making sure that our strategic we and our strategic allies are in leadership of fights and that our tactical allies are supporting us in, in, in leading the fights. So for instance, in the fight around the juvenile hall, the expanded and relocated juvenile hall in Alameda County that I mentioned earlier, we have uh, allies that are white homeowners in the area where the juvenile hall is gonna be built. We have allies that are government officials. Um, we have allies that are government bureaucrats. And we have allies that are on the ground youth organizations. We have allies that are radical nonprofit support institutions. Those are very different kinds of allies. So we're not about to let what a government elected official wants to see happen dictate what we're gonna do in the campaign. That just doesn't make sense. Um, our, the leadership of the campaigns, leadership of the fights, and leadership of the movement should be vested in our strategic allies and not our tactical allies. One of the challenges though is that the way the funding stream works right now is that essentially you go to philanthropists and foundations for money to do your work. And eventually they're gonna get tired of you fighting against rich people, <laughs> quite frankly. And they're gonna try and make you not fight against rich people anymore. That's right. um, so I think that one of the, in, in, you know, in talking about theory flowing from practice, that one of the things that, theory, that we've sort of learned conceptually, that's a problem. We don't know exactly what to do about that problem, but that's a problem. So we need to figure out some new funding streams to actually fund a real freedom and liberation movement. And I think that's part of what this record label thing is about. Um, or I actually know that that's part of what this record label thing is about. Um, but I think we just need to be really, in all of this, I think we've, we've hit a certain level.